Hello, my name is Vincent Voitas. I'm an associate professor in the Interior Architecture Department at Ohio University. I've been a design educator for approximately 12 years, but my background is in painting and I am an active painter. I received my Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Chicago Art Institute in painting, and then I completed my master's work at Northwestern University, also in painting, theory, and practice. Um, I was invited by Kelly Gross to speak about creativity. And what I'd like to talk about today is in the context of um, being an artist and being an educator in design, I'd like to talk a little bit about my perception of creativity as it's evolved in my own practice and as it has been informed by my teaching. A little earlier, Kelly outlined a six-step design evolution sequence that I'd like to revisit here. I tend to use a similar sequence in the courses I teach, and I find this informative in my own work when I think about what I do in the studio. The first, is, the first step is the definition of the problem. In the classroom, this is usually related to a particular kind of problem uh, in an interior architecture scenario. The solution to this comes through a combination of brainstorming and ideation, which is informed by research, historical, social, conceptual, contextual, analytical. Though that information is brought back and informs the development of a plan, usually the development of a plan goes through multiple variations, where finally it comes together in a model, or a series of drawings, or a proposal. And that then is put forward and tested in the context of a critique. Usually, the critique is just the beginning of a revision for a student. Considering these six steps, when I go into my own studio, I am a painter. And Kelly asked me to describe my own process and maybe give a few examples of my work in relationship to how this design pedagogy has sort of played out. Um, one of the things that I find in the studio is, of course, you're always confronted with, when you think about the definition of a problem, uh, at this stage of my own life, I am forced to reflect on the work that I've been making and where it comes from and how to continue that work, um, which involves, of course, paint and mark making on canvases and the history therein. My work historically has been really an investigation of systems through mark making. And by systems, I mean usually two-dimensional grid type structures. Um, this fascination with structures and patterns uh, originated for me in many ways uh, as a consequence of growing up in Chicago and being uh, the student of many sort of modernists or postmodernists who were very referential to the modern movement. Um, and so my interest in the grid and in patterns um, has to do with sort of reinterpreting them in sort of a technological age. Where do we find them? What do they mean? And in the act of making a mark, how, do, how does a person in this day and age internalize and reinterpret their environment through the sort of rudimentary mark making that has a long part of the history and the tradition of painting. And so when you look at the work that I'm presenting here, much of it, of course, uh, has this sort of a residue or an homage to the modernists and to that long historical tradition of the grid. The phases we've outlined as part of the design process, I would argue, are part of art making today, both in the academy and outside of it. I would say this has much to do with the role of conceptualism since the 1960s. This is not to say that before the 60s we didn't have work rooted in significant ideation and in deep conceptual frameworks, but the role of the idea, the place of the idea, the place of research in response to history, social conditions, etc., certainly play a forefront role in the world of art making today. And this is where I think there is a lot of common ground between it and the design process. When I look at my own work in this light, I become aware of the fact that much of the new work that I generate in the studio 
has to do with a response to history. One project that I'm currently working on, which investigates a specific history, is the history of the stations by Barnett Newman. I had never seen the stations by Barnett Newman firsthand, but I knew of them. They are a series of 14 paintings, and a 15th was added after their completion. These paintings occupied Newman from 1958 until 66. As an abstract painter, these intrigued me because Barnett Newman, through his use of line, repetition, rhythm, and order, borrowed the Christian form of the Stations of the Cross, and he appropriated this form for his own contemplation and meditation on loss, specifically the loss of the Holocaust. These paintings initially received poor reception in the 1960s at the Guggenheim, but since that time have become important in his overall body of work. As a part of my own ideation, I set out for Washington, D.C. to see these paintings firsthand. They are in the East Building, the modern wing, of the Smithsonian's art collection. I decided that I would spend an entire morning in the gallery with the paintings. I wanted to see if the sense of loss was conveyed, or what this abstraction of loss would mean as it was conveyed through line, repetition, and order. Going to the museum was my, the completion of my brainstorm and my ideation. For my project, it was important to witness these firsthand and to experience them, and to see if they translated the intention that Barnett Newman had articulated. I spent months, weeks, prior to the trip, looking and studying his work, and upon arrival I was completely overwhelmed by the power of this gallery and these works. I found them to be very difficult works. I found them very difficult to enter. I found most of the commentaries by curators to be true about how inaccessible these works seemed to be. As my research as I was there, I diagrammed and mapped out the gallery to try to better understand the logic of the order and the sequence. What I found, and the more that I spent looking at these, is that the inaccessibility of them is in fact their power. They seem to give very little away. Barnett Newman was a philosophical painter, and his work had many significant historical references to painting and to flatness and to the lack of illusion in the modernist vocabulary. The paintings oscillated between natural canvas with black lines, natural canvas with white lines, and in the later work, as you progress through the galleries, the amount of canvas and white shifts to in the later paintings, where we have larger areas of dark and smaller areas of white. As part of the research, you began to see, in his use of line and mark, that there was a quality to the work similar to calligraphy, similar to what you would find in scroll paintings in China. The very delicate marks that accommodate the zip stripes reminded me of the collections I had seen when I traveled to Beijing. And the quality of those letters and those poems were, had a very similar quality to the evocative presence and the quiet passages in the work. The other thing I found in the work, upon greater scrutiny, is the part of the power of the absence in the planning reminded me, like moving through the columns of a cathedral, the way in which he syncopated line, positive and negative, were like the voids of space in large, cathedral, large cathedrals in Europe. There was a poignance about his absence. There was a poignance about the silence. And perhaps this is where the stations became most effective. It's through the research and the experience you began to make, I found I began to make a number of associations to spaces that were both barren and empty, but at the same time, hopeful. 
This positive and negative absence and presence also reminded me of the work of Tadeo Endo. His Japanese structures, specifically of the room at the Chicago Art Institute, with the columns which are both very present, their presence is a consequence of the negative space between them. The positive and negative that I experienced in the work and the associations that it reminded me of really constituted the research in this project. Because my work is very much about mark making as a kind of recording, it was important to me to go there and see what my response was and to figure out how I would respond to that. In terms of this particular project, where it's going next, it's really in the design process where I'm doing a series of drawings and really trying to figure out what the final work will be. There's part of me, quite honestly, that is skeptical about the response to this project, um, largely because the power of these paintings and their historical context in as a commemoration to the Holocaust makes them very unique. And part of the power of the Holocaust, from an artistic point of view, is very difficult to translate when you don't have that specific historical genetic connection that Barnett Newman did to the event. And so my own drawings and my own work since that time are looking at moments of loss and forms and rhythms and structures of loss in the region where I live now. Um, and we'll see where they go. My hope eventually is that they will generate a final body of work um, that will be displayed in a gallery situation. And the feedback to that then, of course, would be the real test to see if they have a similar sort of effect or power. Um, I don't hope, honestly, to ever be at the level of Barnett Newman in the sense of immensity that he was dealing with. Um, but I do think that there's a lesson to be learned looking back at history and trying to understand how can geometry be used now in the 21st century in a way that might evoke something similar. I thank you for allowing me to contribute to today's discussion. I hope that this example of um, design, education, and artistic practice uh, in an age of conceptual making and practice, uh, both in the academia, both in academia and in the art world, uh, has proved helpful. And I am sorry that I will not be there for comments and questions, but please do feel free to reach me by email, uh, and I will ask Kelly to make that available to you after today's presentation. Thank you very much.